Good afternoon and, and uh, uh, welcome to an overflow crowd. I think many are, uh, we will stream this event and many are probably in an overflow room. Uh, it is not typical of the Wilson Center to have this many people come late on, on a Friday afternoon and it is a great tribute to our speaker. Uh, I'm Jane Harmon, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, a former nine-term member of the U.S. Congress, uh, and delighted that we can host uh, President Pinera today. Uh, I'd first like to welcome his staff and those from the Chilean Embassy. Ambassador uh, Gabriel could, couldn't be with us today because he's still in New York at the U.N. General Assembly uh, with President Bachelet. Uh, welcome also to Michael Shifter, my friend Michael Shifter, who is president of the Inter-American Dialogue, which is co-sponsoring today's event with the Wilson Center. He and Eric Olson, I'll explain who Eric is, will uh, co-moderate uh, a, a short interview with President Pinera after he speaks, and then we will open the floor to your questions. I regret that Cindy Arnson, who is director of the Wilson Center's Latin American program, is not here. Many of you know that this is, uh, uh, these two days are the Jewish uh, New Year and she is away celebrating that. Uh, but she is ably represented by her deputy and our longtime colleague, Eric Olson. Chile has been a shining example of democratic transition for the region over the last 27 years. After a difficult period of military rule, Chile returned to civilian rule in 1990. I know this because before I was a member of Congress, uh, I visited the country twice uh, as part of a National Democratic Institute delegation to observe first the plebiscite and then the election uh, of the first democratically elected president. The peaceful transition of power since then, over the course of six presidents, is important, and our honored guest today was a crucial part of that transition since Sebastian uh, Piñera served as Chile's president from 2010 to 2014, a position he may hold again in the future. Our Latin American program has been deeply connected to Chile over the last 40 years. In fact, it will celebrate its uh, 40th anniversary next week. Uh, we have focused intensely on the challenge of citizen security. Uh, crime, especially transnationally, is a major risk to democratic governance in the region. Chile has been fortunate to have much less crime than many of its neighbors. Uh, we've also uh, focused on the Pacific Alliance, the alliance of Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru, uh, I think an underreported uh, fact and we um, uh, issued a report last year that shows that this alliance, these countries, punch well above their weight with Chile as a star performer. Chile enjoys one of the most successful economies in the region, and former President Piñera understands this well. As president, he worked to reduce the unemployment rate, which dropped dramatically on his watch. It's also an important partner for us on issues like trade and promoting democracy in the region. We share, we, the U.S., share a free trade agreement with Chile that allows 100% of U.S. consumer and industrial goods to be exported to Chile duty-free. I voted for this agreement as a member of Congress in 2003, and I'm very proud that I did. President Piñera is a Harvard-trained economist, one of Chile's most successful entrepreneurs. He has personally invested in the financial, transportation, communications, and sports industries of his country. In addition to his business acumen, before becoming president, uh, um, Mr. Piñera was a senator for nearly a decade. The Wilson Center has a history of ho hosting Chilean presidents for major policy speeches, President, current President Bachelet spoke here exactly one year ago today. Who knew? Uh, and we are thrilled to host President Pinero today to talk about his vision for his country and how the U.S. and the United States can work more closely together. As I said, following his remarks from this podium, uh, Eric Olson and, uh, and, and uh, Michael Shifter will come to the stage and jointly uh, engage him in a conversation. Pre please welcome 
uh, the past and possibly future president of Chile, um, um, Mr. Uh, uh, president Pinera. Pinera. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Thank you very much for coming. I would like to share with you some ideas and some projections about what is happening in Latin America. And basically, what are the new winds that are blowing in this continent? One thing that I would like to express is that until very, until the very few years ago, all countries were poor, so there were no difference. The difference started with the Industrial Revolution, where from one day to another, GDP per capita started to grow like never, ever before. And that had an tre a tremendous impact on quality of life and the population of the world, as you can see in that graphic. But while the world started to grow, Latin America stayed behind. You see that the United States, Europe, and countries like South Korea were able to take advantage of this industrial revolution. <laughs> it wasn't the case of China, it wasn't the case of Latin America until very recently. But within Latin America, there are very different stories. Here you see that some countries were able to do much better than others. For instance, Chile was the poorest uh, Spanish colony in Latin America, and now is by far the country with the highest per capita income and human development and the lowest rate of poverty. Other countries that were very rich have lost grounds. For instance, Argentina, at the beginning of last, last century, was among the five richest countries in the world, richer than Al Germany, richer than France, and now is not within the 50 richest countries in the world. Venezuela was the richest country by far in the 90s, and now it will become, or it probably already is, one of the poorest countries in Latin America. So there are many different stories within Latin America. One big story is Brazil. Here you have two... Uh, portraits of the economy, of the economies, where first you say Brazil is taking off. And very soon after, Brazil is, has blown it. Why is this? Because really Latin America has had different period. The 80s was the lost decade. In terms of per capita income, we, instead of advancing, we went backwards. The 90s was the decade of the recovery. The first decade of this century was the decade of growth. But unfortunately, the second decade of this century has been a decade of stagnation and decline. Why is this? Th we have many different models within Latin America. We have the ALBA countries like Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, and many others. They are following one path that you know, and it's going nowhere. Then we have the Mercosur country that have changed dramatically in the last two or three years, but basically because of what is happening in Brazil and Argentina. And then we have the Pacific Alliance, which have been, during the last year, the fastest growing country because basically they adhere to a stable democracy, open market economy, and stable policies. You can see that the difference between these different models are incredible. You have two trends in growth, very clear, two trends in terms of macroeconomic equilibrium measured by inflation, two trends in terms of investment, and it looks like they were the part of two different worlds. Now th the situation is changing because Argentina and Brazil are moving from the Mercosur Sur, uh, ideology to the Pacific Alliance model of development, and that is changing the mood in Latin America. Latin America is far from its potential. Here we see that in, in some times, in some period, Latin America was able to grow much faster than the world. Now it's just the opposite. And that's something that we'll have to change because it's not a design of God or something that is the fatality. It's basically because we haven't been able to do things like we should have done. But there are many significant political changes in Latin America that are bringing winds of hope. One of them is what is happening in Argentina one of the richest countries in the world, which really, really lost it, its past for decades and decades. And another change which is very significant what is happening in Peru. And the last one, which is also taking place right now, is what is happening in Brazil. At a slower pace, 
and with many problems, but moving, from my point of view, from the wrong to the right direction of development. What winds blows in the world? I would say there are nine mega trends that we have to take care of. First of all, what is happening in terms of the importance of emerging countries? Here you have two pictures of two, of two places in China, the same place. One was taken in, in 1980 and the second one in 2013. That really exemplifies the change that is happening in some uh, emerging countries. The emerging economies, there you have the picture, in, 20, in, in, in 25 years. The emerging economies that used to be only one third of the total world GNP became more than 50% in, in 2010 and now they represent almost two thirds of world GNP. That's a new world. But not only they represent two thirds of world GNP, they represent al also almost two thirds of global growth. And therefore the world that we have now is so different from the world that we had 10 or 15 years ago that it's very important for Latin America to take good care of these changes. And this will continue <laughs> because these are the projections in terms of growth. And you see the, that the Pacific Asia area is the fastest growing area in the world. And unfortunately, Latin America is still lagging behind. In terms of what has changed in the last uh, few, few years, I would say that we have observed the end of three super cycles. The end of the Fed super expansionary monetary policy and the US super borrowing cycle, the end of China super growth cycle and reserve accumulation, and the end of the super commodity price cycle. And that has had a tremendous impact on Latin America. Another tendency that we have to look is that there has been a boom of populist and anti-establishment leadership in the world. There you have a sample. You can take the one that you prefer, but there are many anti-establishment and co to consider populist government in the, in the world, which we didn't have a few years ago. The fourth mega tendency is the global warming and climate, uh, here's a picture, and climate change, which of course will change our way of living, working, and many other things. The fifth is that we are moving from a bipolar and to a, a bipolar and multicultural world. The economy of the United States in 2012, if we, we put that at 100, China was 80, India was 30%, Japan was 28%. Look like how it will be in 2060. Two countries we will, will be in absolute terms richer than the United States, China and India. That's another expression of this new world which is emerging. At the same time, we're experiencing a tremendous and accelerated demographic change. The world is aging. And that also we have and will imply tremendous changes in many different aspects of our lives. And finally, the seventh one is that we are experiencing also a tremendous increase in demand for natural resources, particularly water and energy. By 2050, most uh, most predictors, particularly the OECD, are estimating that food consumption will increase by 60%, water demand by 55%, and energy demand by 37%. And total population will grow by 60% during this period. That will put a tremendous pressure on our natural resources. And a middle class society is emerging. Normally, until very recently, two out of three human beings were living in poverty. That is changing. People are becoming middle class and people are moving from, from the rural areas to the urban areas and that's another major change that is taking place in our society. And the last one is the accelerated <coughs> technology, technological change, which is basically the fourth industrial revolution which is really changing and will keep changing our lives, much more than the revolution that we have already experienced. This is a new one, Internet of Things, robotics, uh, smart cities, and many other things. So the key to the future in Latin America, I think normally well, there were three basic pillars of development, to have a stable democracy that will give you the possibility to think long-term, 
to have a, an open market economy, to take advantage of uh, the potential of our country, and to have a good and sound macroeconomic policy. Those were the old pillars. They are still there, but we need much more than that in order to be able to defeat underdevelopment and poverty, which is something that non Latin American country has been able to do until now. What has happened with Latin America in terms of these three old pillars? Basically, most countries, not all of them, have had huge quality problems in terms of democracy and institutions. And a lot of obstacles and to economic freedom and a very uneven uh, income distribution. So those were weaknesses of Latin America that some countries have been are, are in the process of overcoming. But many others are still, still we have to deal with this problem. So in order of the, the, of the new pillars of development, of course, there are many other new pillars that we will have to develop if we want to become, if we want to become a, 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 a developed co continent. First of all, we have to do a Copernican revolution in terms of the quality of education. And that's the key aspect in order to be able to take advantage of this fourth industrial revolution. Third, second, we have to improve our social inclusion. And that implies not only defeating poverty, but increasing equality of opportunities. Third, we have to promote and not asphyxiate innovation and entrepreneurial capacity. Fourth, we have to triple our investment in science and technology. And we have to take advantage of the globalization and strengthen our integration to the world. And finally, we will need, most countries will need to undertake a huge modernization of the state and of its institution. Those are the challenges I think that Latin America is experiencing right now. Some countries are ahead, other countries are lagging behind. But if we really want to, to make this huge change and transform Latin America in a developed continent without poverty and with real opportunities for everybody, we will do we will need to do much better than what we have been doing in the last few decades. And the question is, in what world do we want to live? And for that, we will need to jump as high as Elena is in Valleva. <laughs> to run as fast as Usain Bolt. And finally, to become a more resilient continent, like was the experience of Farah. Look at Farah. You see? It was the end for him. This was a fi the 5,000 meters final in Tokyo. He was able to overcome that fall, and, and he won the race. Those are the challenges and those are the attitudes that we will need to put together in Latin America in order to change our history and become a continent which has been able to overcome poverty and to become a developed continent. That's basically our challenges and that's why I want to become president of Chile again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. We are uh, gravely grateful for your laying out such a broad and, and interesting vision of, of the region and the challenges that Chile has. I want to thank uh, you for taking the time to, to come over here to the Wilson Center and be with us. Thank you to Michael Shifter as well on the dialogue for co-sponsoring this with us. As Jane Harmon said, we're going to ask the President a few questions and then have time for a few from the audience, so if you'll just hang in there for a minute. Um, I thought I wanted to ask you one that you, one of the issues that one often hears in reference to Chile, and that is uh, Chile has so much going for it, you know, a, 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 a stable democracy, as you mentioned, <laughs> strong institutions, uh, a growing economy, uh, but the refrain often is Chile also is a country of great inequality. 
um, and there's enormous inequality in the economy and in society. And so I guess my question is really, uh, how, do you, how do you see yourself as president uh, trying to address those issues? How does Chile as a whole tackle that problem? Because uh, uh, it, it's an enormous one and, and Chile has advanced in so many regards, but it has that one in front of it as well. Or how, how would you address that? Well, I think that there is no contradiction at all between trying to strengthen growth and at the same time reducing inequality. Right. By the way, <coughs> Latin America is a very unequal continent. Within Latin America, Chile is in the average. But we have been able to move forward on this aspect in a very strong way. For instance, in the 90s, almost 60% of the Chilean population were living in poverty. Today, that rate is or around 10%, similar to what we have in the US. And the inequality, which stayed stable for many periods, during the last, uh, during the, the four years of our government, started to, to, to be reduced significantly, because we were able to reduce poverty by half in four years. So I am fully aware that we have an, an, an equal income distribution that we have to deal with. But the main aspect is, that there is no contradiction because many times when you just put all the emphasis on inequality, you forget about growth. Right. And when you do that, you don't achieve either one. So basically, our strategy is to <coughs> strengthen our capacity to grow. Chile was the fastest growing country in Latin America. For instance, during our government, which was from 2010 until 2014, we were able to grow at 5.5% on average. That means accumulated 27% in four years. That means that if we were able to grow four floors in all our history, we were able to grow the fifth floor in four years. But at the same time, we were able to reduce poverty by half, basically by investing in education, quality education, at early stages, and at the same time creating jobs. There is no better social policy than full employment. Right, right. Those are the main targets, how to improve the quality of education, particularly of the most vulnerable sectors, and at the same time, how to create jobs so everybody will have the abilities and at the same time the opportunities to improve the quality of life. And what are some of the main obstacles you see in Chile to creating those jobs, to making that more a reality? Well, I would say that today the main obstacles that we, this government undertook a major labor reform, which basically has put a lot of rigidities in the labor market. Mm. What happens is that the job creation mm. almost go to zero. Mm. Because in order to be able to create jobs, you need growth, but at the same time, you need flexibility. And therefore, when you create jobs and you achieve full employment, which was our case, salaries start to go up very rapidly. Actually, salaries went up by more than 2% per year during our government. At the same time, working conditions start to improve. Uh, all the training and, and capacitation system also are more demand demanded, and people are not afraid of losing their jobs. So that's a kind of virtuous circle. Mm. With this new labor reform, what happens is that the, the reaction of the economy, because the economy is like it is. The problem was that the job creation went to zero, mm. and the salary stagnated. And therefore, that's not the way, from my point of view, to achieve two goals, to grow and at the same time to reduce poverty and inequality. Right, right. Michael? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Eric and the Wilson Center. It's great to work together and collaborate and, uh, and thank you, Mr. President, for being here. I, Jane Harmon gave an excellent uh, introduction, but if, if I can add one uh, additional thing, which is that you're a member of the Inter-American Dialogue I just wanted to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to leave that part of your resume out because I know that everybody's anxious to hear that. So <laughs> I just wanted to, just wanted to say you. Uh, I had a number of questions on Chile, but I, but I was just wanted to react a little bit to, to your very interesting presentation, if I could, um, before getting to Chile and looking at the region uh, more broadly. Um, there are, you talked about winds of change. You mentioned President Macri and President Kuczynski. Uh, some changes in Brazil. Um, 
But let's look after the election, Chile's elections in November, first round. If there's a second round, it'll be December. And then come three very big elections uh, in South America, uh, Latin America, <coughs> Colombia uh, in, in May, and uh, then comes uh, Mexico in the beginning of July, and then comes Brazil in October. And right now in, in Mexico and Brazil, the leading candidates in the polls are Lopez Obrador in Mexico and Lula da Silva in Brazil. Um, and in Colombia, it's wide open. After eight years of President Uribe, eight years of President Santos, there's tremendous uncertainty about who's going to be elected next president of Colombia. So I'm just wondering how, um, what your sense is about the, the stability of these of these winds of change, whether this is something that you think could be very uh, fleeting, uh, and and you know we could be back a year from now or two years from now with things going in a very different political direction than what you suggested in your in your uh, presentation. So I'm just curious to know how you see this this kind of uncertainty that I think we're seeing in, in, in a number of countries. I'm not I'm not predicting who's going to win in Brazil. <laughs> I'm just saying that. You look at current polls, we can't ignore that uh, these two leaders that don't, I think, reflect the winds of change you're talking about are now, uh, are, are now in the lead. Uh, well, I agree with you that no, nothing is certain. So there are a lot of risks, obviously. I, in the case of Colombia, the election is very open because there are basically three possibilities. The open left, Uribe, who we basically will promote one of his senators, and uh, Vargas Lleras, which is a kind of continuation of Santos, mm -hmm. not exactly. But I think that in the case of Colombia, the possibility of the, of the left of winning the election are very low. So whoever wins, I think, will keep the same path. So I don't see big risk in Colombia from that point of view. In the case of Mexico, it's different, because López Obrador is now ra uh, leading the race. And of course, that will imply a huge change in what uh, Peña Nieto is doing now, is trying to do now. In the so in Mexico, I think there are big, big, big risks. In the case of Brazil, it's different, because I think that Lula is a smart guy, and he has learned the lesson, like, like uh, Garcia in Peru, which was the worst possible president in his first presidency, and it was a, a, a much better one in his second presidency. So if I had to make a, a projection, I would say there are big risks in Mexico, but not in Colombia in Brazil from that point of view. So I think that the, the winds of change that we are observing right now, which is basically to have a stronger compromise with a stable, real democracy, a stronger compromise with a market economy open to the world, mm, and a stronger compromise with sound macroeconomic policy will continue in Colombia and Brazil. Mm -hmm. In the case of Mexico, of course, we don't know. Can I just follow up sure. uh, yeah. on this? Uh, it's funny that you mentioned uh, President Garcia because Alan Garcia, because I, I interviewed him in 2006 before his his second term, um, and I said to him, "I'll ask him the same. I'll ask you the same question I asked him, which was that, uh, and I'll tell you what his answer was, and you can tell me what your answer is." I said to him, "You know, the record of presidents that have come back for second terms in Latin America hasn't been too good." And <laughs> that uh, would change. Sanchez that would change. <laughs> Look at Sanchez Lozada in Bolivia. Look at uh, Carlos Andres Cedes in, 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 in Venezuela. And you know, and um, so uh, are you going to defy? I said, I asked him, are you going to defy the trend? And he said to me, he had a very good response, which Alan Garcia is very, very good at. And he said, well, in the case of those people, they had successful first terms. Uh, <laughs> I <didn't laughs> uh, my first term, he said, was a disaster. So At that time, Garcia was retired, <laughs> <laughs> and he, he was 35, right, right. So he said, he said they, they had good first terms, and I, and, and I didn't, so therefore but he I'm going to have, have a third term. Right, now he's the third term, right. But I'm uh, asking you, you th your problem is that you had a good first term. I mean, you had a successful first term, you had high you know, employment, growth, and so forth, and, uh, you know, is there a, and you, you clearly are <coughs> critical of current president of Chile, Bachelet, who I think, According to all accounts, her, her second term hasn't been as successful as her, as her first term was, certainly if you look at poll numbers. So, uh, you know, are you a little worried about this second term curse and that this could uh, also affect you, or do you think that you're going to be the exception? Because you had a good first term. 
A very good face. Oh, I'm sorry. You're very good. <laughs> I, 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 I had very here. I, 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 I hope I will have an even better <laughs> No, I think that, uh, of course, Chile, as I, as I was telling you before, Chile was able to grow for a long period of time at 5 6% and reduce poverty from 40 to 10%, and at the same time increasing the quality of life. Uh, we multiplied by 6 our per capita income in the last 20, 22, 23 years. We were able to multiply by 6 the number of students engaged in in higher in, in, in university education, many goals were achieved. Now the problem is that the people are much more demanding, and they are really are very concerned about that they want to keep growing, and th for that they need more opportunities. But at the same time, they are asking for better quality of life and better public service, and that's why we have some a, a lot of demands in order to improve the quality of education, improve the quality of health. Before it was to access to education mm -hmm. and health. Mm -hmm. Now that's not the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is quality. And I, I, in Chile, it's a very open country. We have free trade agreements with almost every country in the world. The US, NAFTA, Mexico, <coughs> Canada, Europe, China, Japan, Korea, uh, Vietnam, you name it. And therefore, for us, what is happening with the international economy is very important. So one thing that we have to be very concerned is that uh, if the international economy uh, improves, that will be a tremendous help. Mm -hmm for us. If continue uh, uh, growing at a very low pace, that would be a big problem for us. <coughs> but I'm convinced that there are so many things that are so obvious that have to be changed and that are really putting a break on the our capacity to grow and create jobs that uh, people are very much convinced that we are not following the right path. President Bachelet was elected by a very, very high majority a very huge majority. But very soon, people realized that the policy, her policies were wrong. And that's why she has lost most of the support of the people. And that's why, in, in right now, we are leading the presidential race by a huge margin. Unless something very big happens, we should win this presidential race. And therefore, of course, if I'm running, it's because I think that I will do, I will be a better president in the second term because I have more experience and I'm wiser. <laughs> is there anything, if I could just, one yeah, more sure. is there anything that in your, after your first term that, uh, not in terms of policies per se, but just in terms of gestion, in terms of governing, that you learned? Of course, oh, so many things. The first time we didn't know how to, how to run a country. I mean, we had to learn hmm, in right. office. Okay. So the experience is very important. But at the same time, I think that Chilean people are becoming more responsible in, sen in the sense that they are not buying populist promises, mm -hmm. like they were very mm -hmm. eager to do so before. And so I think that we will be able to triple our rate of growth, which was the same thing that we did in our first government. Mm -hmm. Because the first government of Michel Bachelet was not as bad as this one, from my point of view. But in terms of results, it was a very poor term, mm -hmm. in terms of growth, in terms of employment. So I hope that if we have good wins from the national economy and we uh, are able to put together good and sound public policies, that the Chilean economy will recover its leadership and, and dynamics that we lost. Mm. Let me, before I turn to the audience, and we're going to do that in just a second, so if the folks with mics could be ready. Let me just ask you two more uh, kind of international-oriented questions. One is, one is the obvious question of Venezuela. I mean, everybody in Washington really wants to know what to do about Venezuela and what more can be done. Chile has been very outspoken, has, has uh, uh, voted to suspend uh, Venezuela from Mercosur, has signed the Lima Declaration, has been active within the inter-American system. Um, do, would you foresee in your ad uh, second administration continuing this, this approach? How would, you, how would you think about uh, you know, uh, approaching the Venezuela qu Well, crisis. what is happening in Venezuela is a real tragedy. Not only because they lost the democ democracy, what we have now in Venezuela is, is a full and plain dictatorship. Right. But also because what is happening with the Venezuelan economy. They have been uh, running negative growth rates for the last four years. So Venezuela is now two-thirds of what it was five years ago in terms of uh, per capita income. But the most difficult thing is that politically they are confronted with no way out. And what is happening in terms of humanitarian <laughs> aspects, 
like lack of food, right. lack of uh, medicines. Mm -hmm. So what will happen in Venezuela will be will, 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 will be or could be a humanitarian crisis, which is already already is. Right. Now, in Latin America, at the beginning, Venezuela has a lot of support from Argentina, from uh, Ecuador, from Bolivia, from Brazil, yeah. from Cuba. Now ha that has changed. People are realizing that we have to do something, but nobody knows exactly what to do, including the United States. And then what about China? China has become an increasingly important uh, a, a trading partner, a greater investor in the region. How do you, how do you see China's role in the region and, and Growing fertility? and growing. China is by now, is now by far the largest trading partner of Latin America. And is, that is growing. And I think that the fact that President Trump decided not to continue with the TPP has given China a huge opportunity to increase mm. all its uh, influence in the Asia-Pacific area. Mm. So I think that China will become a stronger player, not only in, in, in economic terms, but also in terms of uh, investment and in terms of influence in Latin America, which is already happening. And you see that as a good thing or not so well, sure? I think that we should, well, I mean, Chile is a very open country and we want to trade with everybody. Yes. But in terms of uh, having a strong political influence of China in the region, I think it's not good. Yeah, okay. All right, I don't know, Michael, do you have one last question? Maybe just one final one. Yeah, here. okay, That's okay. okay. Uh, uh, getting back to these three elections that I mentioned in Colombia, <laughs> um, Brazil, and Mexico, uh, we had a panel recently on this, all these elections, and all the analysts said that the main issue uh, in those three elections was, was gonna be corruption. Uh, and that's, I think, an issue that you didn't talk about. Right. Uh, and I'm wondering how you see that in Chile. <coughs> there was a special commission by Eduardo Engel and President Bachelet. Uh, is this an issue all as well or beyond just sort of the economic question of, a, of creating jobs and growing the economy? Is reducing corruption also something of course. that people are asking for? And of how course. do you think to, to address that issue? Oh, definitely, yes. I mean, it's not only... Our, our concern, our challenge, our mission is not only economic growth, it's much more than that, it's to improve the quality of life. And for that we need to improve the quality of our democracy, our institution, and also to combat corruption in a much stronger way. We have changed our legislation, and now Chile is becoming one of the most transparent countries in the world. And I hope that that will be a good anti antidote against corruption, because at the end of the day there is no better police than sunlight, mm. and there is no better disinfectant than public life. Mm. And I hope, uh, I think that when countries become very open and very transparent, that's a very good, the best way, pos the best possible way to combat corruption. Now, corruption in Brazil is, is probably the worst, uh, b besides, of course, Venezuela. But if you take Brazil, it's probably the most, the country with the most, uh, the most serious corruption problems in, in, in or among the big countries of, uh, of South America. The case of uh, Chile is, is, is in a better shape, but you can never uh, give us uh, any advantage to corruption because yeah. once you realize that mm -hmm. they are moving ahead, it's too late. That's why for us, combating corruption is a key aspect of our strategy. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna take uh, maybe th a round of three questions and then allow President Pineda uh, we have a question up front here, so if you wouldn't kind of talk. Why don't you stay with Ka uh, the gentleman right there, Catalina. If you would uh, give your name uh, in your organization or whatever, that'd be great. We got a question here first, and then we'll go to you, sir. Yeah, uh, Sebastian, Mr. President. Uh, so I'm Uwe Dadouche with the OCP Policy Center in Bruegel. Um, my question is about trade, yeah? Uh, so uh, Chile is open to trade. Uh, you're worried about the international environment. What do you think of uh, current American trade policies? Mr. Trump's uh, speech at the United Nations saying we should all have America first, Chile first in our policies. Do you have a view on those? Thank you. We have a question there and then another one up, up front here. And we'll do another round as well, but go ahead. Um, good afternoon. My name is Christian Santelices. I'm Chilean. I'm uh, former Inter-American Development Bank employee. 
I have a question uh, for you, uh, Mr. President Piñera, uh, if you become president. Uh, Chile is changed in terms of immigration rapidly the last, uh, say, five years. The number of immigrants living in Chile are growing, and there are several nationalities which are particular, like Haiti, which has been increasing dram dramatically, more than uh, triple or four uh, times. So the question is uh, what you would do in order to integrate this uh, immigration in the economy and make the people uh, be a, a force in the wind, in the right direction, rather than, you know, people that can create ghettos and problems in the society. Okay, we have one last question here. Hi, my name is Aaron Sider. I work at the uh, nonprofit in the area. My question for you, Mr. President, is uh, during your first term, commodity prices were pretty high, and although Chile has done a good job of, ex uh, pardon me, diversifying its economy, um, copper prices were relatively high during your presidency. How do you expect to maintain strong growth numbers if copper prices are low in the future? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, with respect to trade, yeah, I, I'm a strong believer in free trade. That's why Chile, and this is something where we have a, a strong consensus within the Chilean society. And therefore, we started with a unilateral policy, which is reducing our own tariffs, and then negotiating bilateral treaties and then multilateral treaties. And we were very much uh, committed with the TPP, which is, is uh, in the air right now. And I think that Mr. Trump approach that America first, of course, every president will say that. But the question is, to close the American economy, is the best way to put America first? I think that he's wrong. And I think that there, there is no contradiction between being a president that wants the best for his country and at the same time to be being a president that wants to open up it, its economy. The idea that you have to have a surplus with every country. For instance, we have a huge deficit with the U.S., which means that the U.S. has a big surplus with Chile. We, don't, we are not concerned about that. Of course, we have surplus with some countries, deficit with other countries. Uh, the important thing is the overall balance. And therefore, I think that this idea that America first means that you have to protect the American economy. If, you, if, if, if I could protect the Chilean economy, I would protect it until the end of the, of the, of the, of the times, of course, infinity. The problem is that you cannot protect the economy. You can protect some sectors at the cost of disprotecting others. And uh, when you really study these things, you will have to conclude that a, an open economy is the best way to develop a country because you take advantage of your comparative advantages. And therefore, you, you take advantage of a specialization in, in many areas. So I think that this uh, idea of America first look great, but it means that you want to close the, 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 the American economy. That's not good for America. That's my impression. With respect to immigration, we, we will have to deal with that because we are receiving a lot of immigrants. And the problem is that we're receiving too many illegal immigrants. So basically, Chile has always been a very open uh, society in terms of receiving immigrants from many, many different, from Europe, from Peru, from uh, Palestine. Uh, now we are receiving many immigrants, particularly from Haiti and, and Republic, Dominican Republic and Peru and Bolivia, which are entering the country in an illegal way. And therefore we want to uh, have a very open country, but to enforce our laws and therefore try to combat illegal immigration and of course promote legal immigration. And with respect to copper price, uh, in, in the case of Chile, it's different because we don't, we don't take into account the current, current price of our macroeconomic policy. We have a stability rule. Basically, we make a projection. What is the long-term uh, price of copper? And we act in, in ba based on that. So if the price of copper is above that long-term projection, we have to say it's 100% of it. And if the price of copper is below that long-term projection, we can dissuade that money. So basically, we are not affected in the short term by copper prices. Of course, in the long term, we are. And in our case, for instance, we, we have to save almost, almost one-third of our copper revenues because of this rule. And therefore, we improve private savings, uh, public savings. That's why Chile now is a net creditor to the world. 
So they were not debt, we're net creditors they were because since we had this uh, high copper price period, we saved most of it. And that's what is being spent now because the copper price is much lower than what it was. So it doesn't have a, a, an immediate impact on the student economy. Of course, as the price is low forever, that will impact the economy. But not immediately because we, we have this stability rule mm, that compensates high copper prices with low copper prices. Okay, we had a couple of questions, uh, I think maybe from the overflow room or online, so let me just read those quickly. One of the issues that's been on in the news uh, related to Chile has been a real strong social movement about education and education reform. You talked about the importance of education. Um, what about this issue of you know, reform of the education system and creating a, 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 a free and accessible education system for, for all Chileans? Is that a priority from your perspective, or how do you understand that? Yeah, there was a very strong movement. Basically, they were asking for free, quality, public education. education right. I agree with the, with the second one, quality education for everybody. But I don't agree that it has to be free for everybody, because we cannot afford it. And I don't agree that it has to be public for everybody, because I prefer <laughs> a, s a, a, s a, s a society that is in charge of the educational process and not the government in charge of the educational process. And therefore, our response to them was, yes, we will improve the quality of education and we will guarantee that nobody will be left out of university education because of lack of resources. What we did, we implement a, a dual system with scholarships for the poorest 50% of the population and loans for the rest at a very subsidized rate. And they pay, they don't pay while, while they are studying. So it doesn't impact their families. They will start paying once they are working and they will not pay more than 10% of their income. Mm. Mm. And therefore, if you are lucky and you are very successful in life, you will return the investment that the, that the state or the society did with you. If you are not lucky, you won't return it. That's basically was our response to this movement. movement I say, and, and we will have free, we will have private university and public university, and it's up to you to decide. We will fund the students, and they will decide whether they go to a public or a private university. That was our main policy. Yeah, of course, we were able to satisfy only two out of three demands because we didn't agree to convert the full university system in Chile in a public system. Mm -hmm. And we didn't agree in a guaranteeing everybody free education independent of their income levels. But we did agree that we had to improve the quality of education, and not only at a higher level, because the, the inequalities start at a much earlier stage. And therefore, we put a lot of effort in improving the quality of preschool education mm -hmm. at a very early ages, because that's where you can make a change in terms of equality of opportunity. Good. Uh, many presidential candidates have, uh, you know, a, a, an agenda for their first hundred days in office. Do you do you ascribe to that? Do you have a list of things you want to accomplish as soon as you get into office? Yeah, we have a program that we will make public next week. Basically, it's a program with an eight-year scope, two governments, right. four years, which is one government, and the first year. And we have a, a timetable, what are we committed to do in different, in the main areas of our priorities and concerns. Mm. Good, okay. All right, we'll take another round of three questions. Let's see, I'm gonna try to be Fair, there's a couple questions back here on the right-hand side. Uh, and let's take one right here in front of you, Anders. Or, oh, you don't have a, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my name is David Jocelyn. I'm an independent consultant. Um, President Pineda, could you describe the present situation in the Araucanía in Chile and your um, approach to defusing that situation, if you were to become president? Okay, and I think there was a question right behind there somewhere. Same oh, same question, okay. We'll take one here, and then we'll come over here to this young woman over here, and I'll try to, we'll try to get a, another round in at least before we're done. So go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. President. My name is Claudia Pacheco. I'm Chilean. I work for the uh, Pan-American Health Organization. 
I'm a great admirer of your first term because you were, I think, capable <coughs> of balance your center-right approach with a very progressive and as well as very social sensitive uh, approach. My question is in, term in terms of uh, social policies. There are, besides, because Eric uh, stole half of my question <laughs> in terms of education, but there are also pending uh, reforms such as the uh, pension reforms, the uh, health reform, and uh, also if you can mention something about the uh, transportation, especially in Santiago, we all know that Trans Santiago is has been used as the, uh, the worst example of a public policy ever applied in a country. So I would like to have your, your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Okay, and there was, I think, one more question over here, this young woman here. I'll come back to you in the next round. Thank you. Kelsey Page, an uh, honors student at Stanford University for the Center of Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. Um, Chile has been a leader in state-sponsored entrepreneurship initiatives with Startup Chile, Corfo, uh, and, and uh, also through the Pacific Alliance with Estela. Um, there's been um, some successes, uh, also criticism that um, entrepreneurship is risky and um, questions about the state's role in providing entrepreneurship support when the return on investment may not be there. So my question is, moving forward, given that entrepreneurship and innovation was one of your main goals, um, what would you do to change or continue the, your previous um, entrepreneurship initiatives? Okay. Well, with respect to Araucania, Araucania is a, a, a region in the southern part of the country where we have a good part of our native population. And it's a very uh, depressed region with a per capita income much lower than the average per capita income in the country and, much and poverty rates much higher. And therefore, our approach is triple. First of all, we need to put a special plan to strengthen the capacity of Araucania to grow, create jobs, opportunities, and invest in, in schools, uh, health, infrastructure. The second aspect is that, is that we have in the Araucania a multicultural society. <laughs> and we have to recognize that and give, I mean, and take that as, a, as an asset of our country, which hasn't always been the case where there was a lot of confrontation between the native people and the Spaniards, which were never able to conquer that, those areas. And the third thing is that we have uh, some problems of terrorism in, in that area, which are very small group, very well organized, funded abroad, and in that case, we will th the only thing we can do is to combat terrorism because that's a, a threat for liberty, for freedom, for development of the whole area. Mm -hmm. That will be our policy with three bases, economic and social development, recognizing the multicultural nature of that area, and combat terrorists with all the strength of the rule of law. <laughs> with respect to social policies, some people talk about a lot about poverty and inequality, but they don't, they don't do much. I think that the best way to combat poverty and inequality are using the, su the two blades of a scissor. The first one is to try to attack the causes, which is basically bad quality of education and lack of opportunity to job, to job, to, to work. <laughs> that, was, that was our basic strategy. <laughs> to invest a lot of money in improving the quality of education in the most vulnerable schools of the country, and to reduce the gap with respect to the average of the country, and create jobs so everybody could find a job. And that was very su successful. As I told you before, in a, a poverty went down by half in four years, and inequality started to go down for the first time in more than three decades, uh, measured by the Gini coefficient or, or any other measure. And therefore, I think those are the key aspects to combat the causes of poverty and inequality. Of course, that will take time. So in the meantime, you have to apply social policies, which is basically what we did with our ethical family income, which was basically a program that would transfer resources to poor family based on three concepts. The first one was <coughs> transfer just because you are poor, with no condition. <laughs> the second part was if you are able to fulfill some a full re a responsibility, for instance, to have your uh, health care programs in, in, in place and, to, and your children attending schools, you will receive a further transfer. And the third one was 
based on merit. If you were able to improve the, the, the performance in the educational system of your kids, or you were able to imp improve the performance of uh, members of the family in the working force, you will receive a third one. So basic was not an assistan assistantialist yeah. policy, but was a kind of alliance. We will help you, but we will help you more if we think that you are helping yourself. And that was very successful. Pe people got the message immediately. And they were not, as therefore, just relying on transferring or, 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 so or social policies, but they were uh, committed in improving or, commit or fulfilling their responsibility in terms of health, in terms of attending school, uh, trying to achieve goals, improving the quality or the performance of the kids in the educational sector, or putting more people of the family to work. That was very successful, and, and right now we have come back to the, the traditional policy, which is basically we will give you money because you are poor, and I don't care if you are trying do, to do something in order to improve your own condition. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any difference. On the contrary, if you improve yourself, you, we, we will reduce the amount of help that you receive from the mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. So people say, I, I'm not interested in finding a job because if I find a job, what I will gain with respect to what I'm receiving now is, is very little. So you are promoting unemployment. And with respect to pension and health and transportation reform, yes, we will have to undertake huge reforms in these three areas. In the case of pensions, uh, the, the expectancy of life in Chile has, in, has increased by almost 20 years in the last 40 years. And we have not taken into account that factor. And therefore, people are living much more, and therefore, with the same savings, they are receiving lower pensions. And therefore, we are trying to increase the amount of savings that is being done every year, and we are trying to promote people staying more time in the labor force beyond their legal retirement age. If they do so, they will receive a kind of compensation and they will receive not only their own savings, but also a matching funds from the government. In terms of transportation, okay, we, we have big problems in Santiago because we have a huge environmental problem in Santiago because of the nature of the city. We have no ventilation. And therefore, we are trying to transform the transportation system and going as quickly as we can to a 100% electric system, mm. which will improve not only, uh, and basically uh, doubling the size of our, under, uh, uh, our subway system. Mm. That will improve the quality of, air, of the air, and not only <coughs> uh, contamination, but also the congestion that we have in the city. And for that, we will need to undertake a huge investment plan in order to improve our transportation system, because as you said, the Trans-Santiago, which was put together by President Bachelet, has been a disaster, a mess, and everybody agrees on, on with that. And finally, with respect to uh, Startup Chile, yes, that was an initiative that we started in our government, basically was to attract innovators to come to Chile, and also to promote innovators, Chilean innovators, to go abroad. And for that, at the depending on the results, the government was willing to take a part of the risk of those entrepreneurs. But up to a given point, because if, uh, if the government take all the risk, then they are not entrepreneurs. I mean, if you want to be a real entrepreneur, you have to be, be willing to take a good part of your own risk. If you take no risk, you are not an entrepreneur, you are a bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for maybe three more questions. I promised the gentleman here, uh, we'll go there, and then one more over here, and I apologize, I won't get to everyone, but uh, Mr. President, can we get a mic up here in, in the front? Thank you. President Andres Mas de Amazon. You mentioned the fourth industrial revolution. Can you share with us your ideas to accelerate Chile's transition to the digital economy, please? Good. Uh, there was another question on over this side. Yeah. Stephen Kaplan. I'm a professor at GW as well as a current fellow here at the Wilson Center. Oh, yes. Uh, my question to you reflects uh, the presentation that you made in the beginning, uh, where you showed sort of trends of economic dynamism, uh, technology and job disruption, changing the role of technocrats, right, where technocrats have to think more and more about the quality of education, innovation, the quality of healthcare, things along these lines. I want to know from you, too, how you think that these patterns, economic dynamism, uh, technology, uh, as well as job disruption, job market disruption, how that changes the role of a politician 
as a communicator, <coughs> right? Uh, and how does a politician communicate in economies and environments that are constantly changing, uh, particularly from a technological standpoint? And we have one final question back there, and my apologies, I couldn't get to everybody, but go ahead. Uh, my name is Tomas Dingus. Uh, I run a private conservation effort in, um, in Chile. Uh, question, <coughs> um, traditional growth in the past has often come at the expense of the environment uh, and without proper consultation, uh, usually with uh, people affected by it, um, by any environmental destruction. Chile has, there's a couple of recent examples, Dominga, Alto Maipo, uh, a large dam that didn't go forth in the south um, that were halted primarily or slowed down because of either poor planning or citizen pressures. I'm curious about uh, your, your take on the environment. Um, you, know, you mentioned natural resources, climate change, uh, as it relates to growth uh, in the future of Chile. Okay, thank you. And then uh, I'll give Michael a chance to ask a final question if he wants. Uh, do you want to now or after? Shall I after? Okay, go ahead. Now or never? Never, oh, never. never. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, let me ask it now then, because uh, I may never get a chance again. Uh, one issue that is, I know is prominent in your platform, but we haven't really discussed, and I wonder if you could talk about it, is the issue of uh, crime and security, urban crime and security. Uh, Chile doesn't, uh, one doesn't associate Chile uh, compared with many other countries in the region as having a, a problem. But certainly if you look at uh, surveys and polls, it's, it's a dominant concern for a lot of people. And um, you know, wh what do you see as having been the most sort of effective way to reduce levels of, uh, of violence and crime? And uh, what, what changes would you make to current policy in Chile to deal with that problem? With respect to the, this technological revolution, of course it will change everything. If you take into account what will, the the, what will be the impact of the Internet of Things, the Web 1.0 connected computers with computers, the Web 2.0 computer with person, the Web 3.0 computer with person with person with things in a, in a, in a framework of artificial intelligence. Like our, the human body. None of you are, is, is concerned about uh, your heart being uh, uh, beating right now. But it happens because we have this connection in, w in the framework of an in artificial intelligence. And therefore, what will happen when Internet of Things is fully applied in terms of how we will live in our homes, in our offices, in our cities? That's a huge change that will help us to solve many, many problems. So I would say that this in, uh, technological revolution, from my point of view, is a, is a very strong ally for many of the as aspects and goals that we want to achieve. What will happen in terms of robotics? We know that almost 50% of jobs that we have today could be replaced by, computer, by uh, robots right now, and that will just keep growing. Of course, this revolution will destroy jobs, but also will create jobs. So the question is, in what part of the, of the cycle you want to be? And for that, you need to change dramatically the, the quality and the nature of the educational sector. Because basically, uh, 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 even in the US, you are, very, you are lagging behind a lot with respect to other countries. And the same thing with respect to globalization. So I would say that we need to put a lot of attention and a lot of concern and planning in how to take advantage of this revolution that is coming. And from that point of view, <coughs> I, I think that in many cases we will need to change our regulations because they are, uh, very, uh, uh, they are an uh, obstacle to take advantage of many of these changes that are happening and will happen with or without our will. With respect to, to uh, growth and environment, of course that we need sustainable growth, which means that we need growth, but also we need to protect our nature and our environment. Sure. And, for that, and for that, you need to have good regulations. And regulations that will be applied immediately. Not, they cannot take for years and years and years, which is the case in Chile right now. In order to approve a project in Chile, you need 10 years. Doesn't mean that you really need 10 years. 
it takes 10 years because it's so bureaucratic mm, and so complex. So we are planning to undertake a major change in how to compatibilize environment protection and growth. And finally, with respect to uh, organized uh, crime, mm, in, in terms of international comparison, Chile is still doing very well. But it is the first or the second major concern of the Chilean people. And therefore, for that, we are planning to do many, many different things. One thing is that we need to undertake a huge modernization of our police. We, had, we have had many meetings with the for ma former Major Giuliani and, and his team on how to in modernize and improve the instruments and the abilities of the police to combat crime, <laughs> especially crime that is becoming much more organized and is much more uh, violent than it wa wa what it was. And at the same time, we need to have a better coordination between police, attorneys, and judges. Because many, in many cases in Chile, what happens is that they put the blame on each other. <laughs> the attorney will say, I didn't receive the, the, the information and the data and the facts and the proofs. Or the judge will say, I didn't receive enough proof in order to condemn. And that's why in Chile, we have a very high uh, rate of impunity. Almost 92% of the crimes that are committed in Chile never find never condemned or, or make any uh, attempt to, uh, to arrive to who is whoever is guilty of that. That's, that's why that's another area where we have to make a, a big effort in terms of improving, particularly improving uh, in police intelligence. Because <coughs> when you have organized crime, <laughs> in Chile the crimes are not being committed by individual persons. They are organized crimes, groups of people that organize themselves to commit crimes. And therefore, for that, to combat that, you need to have m better intelligence in order to infiltrate these groups and, it, and being able to dismantle them and to put them to, to justice. That's another uh, big, big challenge that we have to face. Well, Mr. President, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, President Piñera <laughs> for his time here. We are, of course, nonpartisan. The decision will be the Chileans, but let me be the first to say that I'm sure Michael and I would be happy to host you again, uh, should you be elected uh, in November, December. Then you will. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you to all the team that's helped put this on, our AD, our, our volunteers. We couldn't have done it without you. And thank you, Michael, thank you. as well, and the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.